I carry that forward. Like I, yeah. I, I see the tools as being all the tools as being important. Yeah. Because you know, they allow us to do the thing, which is I feel the most important thing. Yeah. Is the marking. Yeah. And the process around the marking. Yeah. You know. Um, and I think it's some for me. My and this is just my thinking. I think it's important that we don't get um, we don't uh, restrict ourselves. Yeah. By by getting caught up in the conversation around well, if it's not done with yeah. this tool in this way, it's not authentic. Yeah. Because I will. Who's it? Yeah. <laughs> The Transformative Marks podcast explores how Indigenous tattoo artists, cultural tattoo practitioners, and ancestral skin markers transform this world for the better, dot by dot, line by line, and stitch by stitch. My name is Dion Kazis. I'm a Hungarian, Métis, and Intikatmuk professional tattoo artist and ancestral skin marker. I started the work of reviving my ancestral Intikatmuk skin marking practice over a decade ago. I have helped, supported, and trained practitioners and tattoo artists here on Turtle Island. In this podcast, I sit down with Indigenous tattoo artists, cultural tattoo practitioners, and ancestral skin markers from across the globe, bringing you behind the scenes of this powerful, transformative, and spiritual work. Um, si te ofa, um, ko taria ko matangi ho kuingoa, um, me pangai motu vavau. Uh, me kolo vai tonga tapu, me amoi uh, northern Norway. Um, my name is Tadia Kolomatangi. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I'm from uh, the villages of Pangai Motu on the island of Vavau. Yeah. Um, kolo vai on the island of Tonga Tapu, and a small island in the north of Norway called Amoi. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, I'm a uh, artist and uh, tattoo practitioner. Yeah, cultural tattoo practitioner. Um, my work is centered on the um, revitalization of Tongan tattooing. Yeah, uh, traditional tattooing. Um, yeah, man, I'm just stoked to be here sharing with you, brother. Cool. Yeah. yeah, we've been here, you know, so our second day visiting with you. So, yeah. you know, uh, in preparation for the Museum of Vancouver exhibition, True, True Tribal, uh, contemporary expressions of ancestral skin marking or some iteration of that, you know, that'll mm-hmm. be kind of be the working title. Um, but yeah, you have brought some, uh, some, uh, ancestral, uh, what would you call it? Uh, like a drink? Would yeah, you... it's uh, it's kava. Yeah. So kava is uh, is a um, a beverage that's made from the root of the kava plant. Yeah. Um, and it's part of like traditionally, it's part of uh, our uh, kind of ceremony and ritual. Mm. Um, in this context, where we're using kava just for dalanoa, so for you, dalanoa is you and I in conversation, cool, you know, and discussing whatever we're discussing, yeah, deep, deep subjects, not yeah. so deep subjects, whatever yeah. we, wherever we choose to go with it, and the kava is a is a way for us to connect essentially, mm. you know, um, there's a beautiful saying that relates to kava and the consumption of kava, and that saying is uh, puke puke for noa. Mm. So uh, puke puke means to to hold on tightly, yeah. to to embrace or to grip tightly, and fonua is is land. But fonua in a Tongan context also can mean people of the land. Yeah. Um, it also means uh, it's got an interesting kind of life cycle sort of uh, meaning too, because it can mean placenta, mm-hmm. but fonua can also mean um, a gravesite. So it almost talks to like cycles of life, you yeah. know, which I think is is quite beautiful. Yeah. So when we're consuming kava, when we're sharing in kava, we are we are gripping on, holding on tightly yeah. to to all those ideas around yeah. uh, all those cultural ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. For us, bro, it's just yeah, it's about us connecting, connecting over some and, kava. Yeah. And this particular strain of kava is from uh, Vavau, mm. which is where I connect to. Okay. So I'm sharing my fonua with you, bro. Cool. Sharing my land Thank you. with you. Yeah, that's beautiful. And yeah, I just wanted to yeah be able to uh, so people can see you know what we're doing, what we're drinking, and uh, also give some context because mm-hmm. not everybody's familiar, you mm-hmm. know, uh, with uh, kava and you know the sharing of it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, if you want to give us a bowl.
So after we've had our bowl, we can we can just say malo, which is to give thanks. Malo. Malo. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Malo. Malo. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that and, uh, you know, uh, opening our conversation in that good way that comes from your land and your people and your culture. And, you know, it's certainly connected with the work that we're going to be talking about mm. in terms of tattoo. Um, so, yeah, you know, just tell me kind of uh, open it. Let's open it up with a, a journey of how you got into the work. Okay. You know, we explored that in a further interview earlier, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. you know, just to give context here and mm -hmm. uh, we can expand that this time because I know last time I asked you to give me a short mm -hmm. version, you can expand to wherever it needs to go in this, okay. in this one. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, thanks, bro. I mean, my, my, um, at least my journey with tattooing started in the late 90s. Um, I was introduced to a Samoan tofunga. Mm -hmm. um, tofunga is like um, uh, a, 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 that's the best way to describe tofunga. It's like a, a master, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, a highly skilled practitioner of yeah. of various art forms, yeah. certain art forms. And this this tofunga was a tofunga tatatau, so he was a pra uh, a master of tattooing. Mm -hmm. Samoan, um, his name was Sua Sulua Pepaulo. Um, I got introduced to him through a, a mutual friend and I went along to um, not really having much knowledge, in fact having almost zero knowledge about a traditional mm. Tongan practice. You know, I'd had some glimpses into uh, a Samoan practice, mm. but at that point the uh, my understanding of a traditional Tongan practice was, was pretty minimal. Mm. Um, I'd seen this book actually that had come out. Uh, I think it was either the year before, or maybe a couple of years before, called "The Art of Tonga," mm. and that's that book. I mean, this is the '90s, bro, so we're still kind of pre-internet, yeah. you yeah. know, mass yeah. internet days. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that book had an image in it on mm. on a uh, of a Tongan tattoo on a male. Yeah, there was no really, there was no identifying. Any, any other sort of identifying information we didn't we didn't uh, we knew that it was done on Tonga Tapu which is the big island in Tonga um, and he was a Tongan man um, and yeah it's just a striking mm. image you know like and I'd, I'd never seen it before in my life and that really was the my first my first awareness around a traditional practice yeah. for Tongan tattooing for Tongans and um yeah, that kind of blew my mind, and I sort of, you know, sat on that for a while, and and kind of got excited about the possibility of a of a Tongan uh, tattooing tradition. And then it wasn't until a little while later that I met Paulo and started talking with him about it. And you know, I took that book to him. Yeah. And my initial thought was like, oh, I'll take this book to Paul to. You know, I met this guy, and I was like, I'll take this book to him, and I'll show him this Tongan tattoo, and yeah. maybe I can get an armband that yeah. kind of makes <laughs> there's a nod to the tattoo, you know, yeah, yeah. but not the real thing. Well, the real thing, but not to that extent, you know, because the image was of a man's thighs and mm. torso, and he was tattooed completely, and you know, covered lots of heavy black work too, yeah. and. um you know, I always remember that I took that book to Paulo, and first of all, first off, he'd already seen the book, so he yeah. was fully aware of the book, yeah. aware of the image, and um, and he kind of put the challenge to me. He was just like, you know, I was talking armband idea, and he said to me, "Oh, why would you get an armband when you could get the real thing?" You know, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, something yeah. along those lines. And but I, at that point, hadn't really kind of mm. even considered it, you know, and I'm not too sure why I hadn't considered it. Um. And uh, yeah, that really was the beginning for me. Was that yeah. image in the book and the meeting with with mm. uh, Bolo? Yeah. Wow. And then from there, it was, um, you know, it was a it was a, it was a journey. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Took took a while to find my way as a practitioner. Mm. Um, but in those early days, it was it was really about kind of spending time with practitioners and you know a lot of learning goes on through observation you know mm -hmm. and I had the privilege of sometimes being invited to sit on the mat next to Paulo so I could see the work happening mm -hmm. right in front of me yeah 
and uh and then eventually i took up the challenge wow and um and you know he was like okay we're gonna do this and yeah. <clears throat> it was the first it was the first move towards the tongan tattoo revival mm. was with the markings that Paulo put on me yeah um that was 99 wow and uh and from that the plan was to finish the work yeah and then the next step was for me to learn the tools yeah and and to continue on the work essentially yeah yeah, yeah. yeah man um and then like i shared with you earlier you know mm. uh sadly sadly um Bolo was killed mm. um shortly after we started the work and that kind of just yeah that sort of shook the whole tattooing community here yeah. in aotearoa and and you know across the pacific yeah because one of the amazing things that Paulo had done was he had he had helped other um, practitioners across the Pacific to revive their practices. Yeah, he was uh, instrumental in the Hawaiian revival. Yeah, working with Kione Nunes. Mm -hmm. um, he worked with Maori yeah. here yeah. to to reintroduce them to the tools. Yeah, um, and through those, um, you know, that's a couple of examples, and then through through those um, those kind of those movements that he sort of instigated, you know, went on to to others learning yeah. from the likes of Kilne, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he played a really significant yeah kind of role in in the particularly in the South Pacific, the yeah. indigenous revival of of yeah. of these traditional practices. Yeah. Yeah. And from you know, but as I said, he was he was um, he was killed, and. Uh, for me personally, that just kind of, kind of, I was a little bit cast adrift. You yeah, know? And I wasn't quite sure where I was going yeah. after that point. Um, from that point, and sort of took the, I, I didn't, I didn't really, um, I well, I didn't pick up the tools or, or become serious about picking up the um, the work as a practitioner until several years later. My my sort of initial my my next move really was just to start researching. Yeah, you know, I was really interested in just understanding more and as much as I could. Yeah, um, about a Tongan practice. Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess we first met. I think was it 2015. Yeah, I think 2015, 2015. or 2016, somewhere in there. Anyway, yeah. and um, that was with Indigenous Inks. Yeah, so you want to tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so part of, I mean, I, I kind of, I suppose, took a, um, as part of my, um, what I saw as part of my contribution to the indigenous tattooing, the global movement mm. was 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 to put pull together this uh, a, a gathering, a gathering of indigenous practitioners from as far out as I could reach, and yeah. and, and those who were able to come, um, and we. Started that actually in 2011 oh, okay. was the first one we did, and it was very small scale, man. Yeah. It was, um, and it was really centered on the South Pacific. Yeah, we had uh, Samoan practitioners, Maori practitioners, um, a Tongan practitioner, Carl, yeah. um, and I think that was maybe a Rarotongan as well. So it was really centered on the South Pacific, but it was yeah. the first move towards what you came to know as Indigenous Inc. Yeah, which in Really, quite a short space of time. It went from this really intimate small gathering to to being an international gathering yeah. of some really important practitioners, man, yeah. like yourself. You know, who really, who really, uh, yeah, really instrumental in the revival of their mm. their practices for their people. Yeah, you know. Yeah, um, and that was an incredible. You know, I think the the last one, which was the really small scale one we yep. did at the studio, yeah, it was twenty sixteen, maybe. I think so, yeah. Yeah, and, it, and to be honest, it kind of started getting a bit too big for me to to yeah. to kind of manage. Yeah, you know, uh, and I was just, I thought maybe it's time to kind of pull it back a little bit and go yeah. back to this kind of intimate gathering. Um, and then it's awesome to see the likes of of um, Toy Kitty, right? Yeah. Who seems yeah. to have kind of picked up and continued yeah. on with that momentum. Yeah. So it's nice to to see that there's still spaces being made for us to come together. 
Yeah, and I would say, like, <clears throat> when I think about that gathering, like, like you said, like, it was, it brought together a variety of practitioners from all across the world. Yeah. And all of those practitioners now are at the spearhead of the revival movements in their communities and communities connected to them. Mm. Like, it's pretty, uh, it's a pretty powerful, um, Catalyst, and the reason I say that is because of my own experience and other practitioners' experiences that I've spoken with. You know, at that time, uh, you, you feel real lonely. Yeah, man. you know, when you're doing that work, and you know, not everybody can relate to it. Even if you're in a tattoo shop, you know, you're usually the only. You know, my experience, the only Indigenous person there. So, like, you don't have people to connect with that are doing mm -hmm. that same work. And so, for me, that was like. Uh, so instrumental in my own experience and in my own growth to be connected with people from all across the world who were doing similar things in their own communities had experienced the same colonial project, you mm -hmm. know, placed upon them and their people and their culture mm -hmm. and going through similar struggles. Mm -hmm. So I would say there was really like a important event that uh, helped to, I guess, do what you uh, anticipated that would it, it would be you know that dream mm. that you had of supporting indigenous tattooing i would say that event was one of those major things uh in the movement mm. so i just hold you up and you know holding that for the time that you did you know because of course i know from uh my own experience of uh what was hosting events, you know, planning things, you know, getting together the funding and all of the work and the turmoil of actually doing those things. A lot of people don't actually know what it takes to hold those things mm. and to bring them together. Mm. And everybody has their two cents about the, you know, the one cent of thing there is to <laughs> talk about, right? And so those are really difficult things to hold. And so mm. I just hold you yeah. up for you know, doing that for the time that you did, I think it was a really integral part of the work that's happening now. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really, um, yeah, it's really warming to hear that. Mm. And it's a it's a similar feedback that yeah. I've heard from from a number of, you know, yeah. the practitioners who were, who were involved in Indigenous Inc. in those yeah. days, you know, it became, yeah, it became that, that, that sort of, uh, kind of like a bit of an access point for people to kind yeah. of, you know, connect and pivot. Yeah, you know? big time. Um, yeah, and I'm just really stoked that that um, the likes of Julie have kind of picked that momentum yeah. up again, you know, and, yeah. and keep because it's needed. Oh, yeah. Know? It's so needed. And, you know, I've got all these young ones coming through, yeah. you know, and uh, who are going to learn from all the ones like yourself mm. who are, like you say, at the spearhead of yeah. these movements. And, uh, and that's work, man, yeah. holding that down mm. do you know what i mean like yeah. you're that's yeah. that's work so yeah to have to have things like Torquiri come up recently mm. and see that 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 seems to be really kind of growing and and, yeah. and being really well supported from from across the indigenous tattooing community yeah is is huge you know yeah big time and um and even like for myself man you know I, I was still kind of on the edges as a practitioner. You know, yeah. I was I hadn't really done the deep dive at that mm. point. And like I said, I saw my my role and I guess my work at that time being about kind of yeah, holding that space or creating that space or, yeah. or helping create that yeah. space. You know, um, that was a huge learning yeah. experience for me. Man. Oh yeah, you know, like just having all you guys around and. And seeing all the different practices, and then seeing you guys kind of all connecting and um, and and feeding and buzzing off each other, you yeah. know, like yeah, that was huge. Um, and really, for me, kind of reignited my passion to mm. to really, um, you know, really focus in on 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 the work as a practitioner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I reflect, actually, um, I would say probably this podcast was birthed from that experience because when I came, I think you probably remember in your basement, we did a couple <laughs> little interviews for my master's thesis. That's right. right. I remember. And I remember like that experience of having, and also the experience of just having powerful conversations with, mm -hmm. you know, amazing people that are doing amazing work in their communities and cultures, mm. you know, 
I get that inspiration. I get that fire. Then I, you know, after recording those, you know, I know people who have listened to those recordings that mm -hmm. I did, you know, back in 2015. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you know, their minds are just blown by the little gems that are contained in there. And so I was like, oh, I need to share this. Mm. You know, I need to share these conversations that we have when mm -hmm. we're sitting together. Mm. You know, uh, just power, you know, just powerful people doing powerful work. And then, yeah. you know, like That's I said, cool. if we all put, you know, if we only get one gem from each conversation, you know, after 30 conversations, that a lot of, that's a lot of gems for people to pick up and put in their tool basket that's to take it. with them as they go. That's it. So, yeah, you know, a lot, I think a lot of things came from that. So it's, uh, you know, uh, it was, it is important work that you've done there. Thank you, brother. Mm. Appreciate that. One thing I want to, uh, kind of circle back <clears throat> that we started in our interview earlier, um, is, you know, we have, there's like this interesting thing that happens that I've observed in the indigenous tattoo world or skin marking practice is almost this hierarchy of authenticity, I call mm. it. And so, you know, we had a brief conversation about it earlier in terms of your own practice of mm. using the ancestral tools and technology of tapping and also machine. Mm. And so do you want to explore that a little bit with me? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, like I touched on earlier, my, my very first, um, I guess my first schooling around the practice was, was seeing those tools side by side, being used side by side on traditional work. Yeah. You know, so that's fr so from, from the very beginning, I, I didn't, you know, that sense of some type of hierarchy around tools, for example, never was just not a thing. Yeah. It wasn't part of that initial conversation, right? Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, for me personally, I, I, I carry that forward. Like I, yeah. I, I see the tools as being, all the tools as being important. Yeah. You know, because they allow us to do the thing, which is, I feel, the most important thing. Yeah. Is the marking. Yeah. And the process around the marking. Yeah. You know. Um, and I think it's, um, for me, my, and this is just my thinking, I think it's important that we don't get, um, we don't uh, restrict ourselves yeah. by by getting caught up in the conversation around, well, if it's not done with yeah. this tool in this way, it's not authentic. Yeah. But so, well, who said? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> and the one thing I I was reflecting on with Julie is, you know, if that's the com if that's the you know the hill we're gonna die on is that uh you know it has to be done this way or else it's not authentic mm. how many uh marks are you invalidating exactly man. if that's the position that you're taking well if you think about all the moko kawai and all the kanohi that are walking around that are becoming so just normal now right yeah you know, if we take that sort of stance that, oh, it's not done with the uhi, with the hand tools, it's not authentic or traditional or the real thing. Yeah. Then, yeah, like you say, we're, we're, we're just kind of dismissing all that work. Yeah. All that whakapapa, all that genealogy. Yeah. All the mana of those people and their ancestors. Yeah. Who are we to do that? Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, when you, when you see that work, that power is there. Right. There's no denying it. There's so, no denying it. For me, it's just, yeah, I just always like to bring that up mm. and have this conversation because I think it's one that's important. It's really important. Yeah. And it's not to say when I say those things, I'm not saying that there isn't a particular experience that you have when you're being tattooed or marked with your ancestral tools and mm. technology. Mm. I definitely think, uh, even from my own experience being skin stitched, it's a different experience mm -hmm. than it is with the machine. Mm. But that doesn't mean that it's better. Mm. That doesn't mean that uh, it's more authentic. Mm. It just means that it's a different experience. That's right. Right? Yeah. And, you know, like Keone says, you know, it's like a time machine. You can actually feel what your ancestors felt That's when it. you get marked with those tools. That's it. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the other one isn't also valid. That's it's right. just different. It's unique. They're both unique. And I always say it's like the right tool for the job. That's it. Right? And so you just pick the right tool for the job. And for me, when I uh, mark the face, I, I only use the hand poke or skin stitch. Mm -hmm. That's just my choice. Not mm -hmm. saying that 
you know, the pieces that I did with machine on the face are invalid. That's just my choice as I move forward. That's mm. the experience that I would like to give to those people who are getting that work. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, I have the same approach when I'm doing um, the markings on the legs, for yeah. example, on men and women. I like to use the hand tools for that yeah. work because, like you say, it's it it just feels like the appropriate tool for that. Yeah, that work. Yeah, you know. But yeah. I like also to have many tools in my in my I, tool belt. Totally. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and yeah. I think, time. I think uh, yeah, there there are there are there are kind of um, qualities and restrictions in both tools. Yeah. You know, both if you're going electric and and hand yeah. tools, you know, they they both have beautiful qualities and they both have some restriction. Yeah. Because- which you can work with, and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I I I I think along the same ways. Where it's you know it's about it's about having the tools that you choose to work with mm. in your tool belt. Yeah. You know, and there's no, you know, we don't want to kind of get into this like uh, you know where we're policing ourselves. So yeah. Kind yeah, of yeah, big time. heavily and str- strict. And strictly that we're kind of restricting ourselves yeah. through that, you know. Because yeah. I've got, you know, all these young ones who are coming through. My daughter, my daughter, for example, you know, she's she, her focus. She's Maori and Tongan, mm. so her whaka papa, um, and Norwegian, and a little bit of Scottish, and you know, a few things like this. But she's chosen to do tamoko as her focus. Yeah. In the future, she may move into doing Tongan work potentially, but she's chosen to to use the machine and she's creating incredible work with those with those machines as are all these other young ones coming through. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, and I've always said to her, like, you know, there's, it's all available to you. Mm. It's it's what you choose to work with and yeah. and allow you you know, allow yourself the opportunity to explore all the tools at some point. Yeah. If you choose to. Yeah, big time. But don't shut yourself off. Yeah, don't don't stop that. Yeah. Um one thing I wanted to explore again uh is, you know, uh the inspiration that you take. How you know, where do you find the inspiration to create the pieces that you're doing? Mm-hmm. I'd say um there's um Like there are koloa or treasures that I have within my family mm-hmm. that are that are objects that are mats that are um, the the kaffa that I showed you yesterday the yeah. the sort of uh, I guess it's a belt yeah um, you know Tongans wear these wear mats around their waist called tauvala and we 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 tie a belt around to hold the mat in place and and the the kaffa I showed you yesterday is made from the hair of my my grandmother and and other women from from um, from from that line, and uh, I'm not sure how. I'm, I know it goes back a couple, maybe more generations. Yes, you know. So there's, you know, that's a powerful kind of object to mm. to handle. But there's also inspiration in that that could come through. And yeah. uh, like for example, I've done work around the kind of torso that I reference kafa specifically. Cool. And this idea that the work is 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 kind of holding together or binding together things around the yeah. around this region, which is a sacred region yeah. of the body, you know. Um, yeah. So there are there are objects and, and and material that exist that are treasures within my own family. There are stories that we hear uh, within the family and other stories that have been captured and recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, by um, you know missionaries or or adventurers who've kind of made their way to the islands, you know, who've recorded their 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 experiences. There are stories in there that mention tattooing that become um, and there there there's not many of those stories, but there's a there's a few, and they just mention. They don't really go into detail about what it is, but they might mention a body part or they yeah. might mention a you know a form that has a particular look to it yeah so that becomes uh, an, an opportunity to explore what how would that what, what what would that look like how would that work how do i find my way in these ideas yeah um and then uh and then we have other color like uh, our war clubs mm. um 
We have, uh, there's a beautiful kind of series of patterns that exist within the lashing of the houses. So back in the day, when uh, when houses were constructed, yeah, they would be bound together with mm. um, kaffa, which is another uh, is a is another uh, made from coconuts in it. Okay, and it's um, kind of bound, so it's, it sort of serves a, a a function, a practical function in terms of holding the house together. Yeah, but within that, patterns are woven into it, so you get these incredible kind of motifs that start to appear through the through the various kind of um, um, weaving techniques used in the kaffa. Yeah. Um, and that 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 um, that uh, art, art form is called lalava. Mm. And so, again, what I find interesting about lalava is this idea of wrapping things, you know. Mm. And, again, I've made reference to lalava in some of the work I've done where if I'm doing a forearm, for example, yeah, you know, we kind of, imagine that this thing is wrapping and binding around the arm uh-huh. and that becomes the kind of design structure that we work within yeah or around or with and then we find pattern within that you know so wow. um I, I you know even though tongan tattooing there's very little uh information about tongan tattooing historically hmm. i think there's more that will come out across time mm-hmm. as as we continue to to dig and turn over stones you know yeah, we'll, we'll keep finding more information but for me there are clues and other things that you know other um, material culture that's that's yeah. ex- existed across time that's that's survived you know yeah. um colonization <laughs> yeah and so those all become those all become the clues that we can kind of you know like say for example for me the war clubs i look at them Mm. They're a, they're an object in the round, and the the way pattern is used on them is moving around mm. this this wooden object, this war club, and so you know straight away for me there's a total sense in how that might move around the leg, for example. Yeah. So all the it's all there. It's just starting to kind of unravel it, and, yeah. and then you know deconstruct it, and then reconstruct it as tattoo. Yeah. You know, big time. So it's interesting. <clears throat> The way that you talk about it so it's not just the motifs themselves but the way that they're constructed on the object as well that you're looking at yeah, yeah. and I, I relate that to the body yeah you know so the the a war club for example I, I think i mentioned this to you earlier you know some of the war clubs were the personification of of a chief yeah or a particular warrior yeah. so they they are alive they have a name. They're yeah. given a name, and yeah. so they are them themselves regarded as as part of the community, mm. you know. Um, and so, yeah, it's just the idea that 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 um, we look at the body in the same way. These are bodies, yeah. And so, for me, the translation from that body to this mm. body kind of makes sense and yeah. feels quite smooth. Yeah, you know, I'm yeah, not yeah. I'm not looking at a um, you know, an object that has that I feel may not have no relationship to body, yeah. yeah. And trying to think, oh, well, how do I take that, and make that into something that's bodily, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah you're um, taking it from, taking those clues, yeah, yeah, yeah. The clues are, uh, you know, for us because there is so little mm-hmm. uh, information and and there's evidence, which is great, that gives us enough to charge ahead, yeah. But in terms of specific tattooing, um you know um accounts and 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 information it's very little yeah. you know so we start looking around and seeing yeah. okay well and we know all of our all of our art forms are interconnected yeah you know yeah big time they're all interconnected they're all talking about we're kind of using these things to express our stories yeah you know? um to contain our stories you yeah, know big time. to share our stories with generations yeah you know, the next generation and to understand the stories of the previous generation, yeah. you know, so okay. there's, and it's all kind of interwoven and interconnected, you know, so, um, it, it yeah, a lot of it just is, is kind of practical too. Yeah. You know, it's, there's just a practical, we have a practical nature about us, I think, as 100%. indigenous people, right? Yeah. We, we have to, you know, ultimately, you know, back in the day, a lot of stuff centered around survival, you yeah, know, which is a practical time. way to be in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Just pick it up what you need when you need it. That's it. Yeah. And I, yeah. I would say that that's also like, um, 
I would say some important things to tease out of the conversation we're having because I know a lot of people back home in Turtle Island, you know, they don't, they're in a similar position, if not a worse off position where maybe they have like one sentence that says they're, mm. their ancestors tattooed. Mm. Right. And so I'm always, you know, pushing uh, people to again, look outside those anthropological boxes. Mm. Right. Because we you know, people go, Oh, we don't have any tattoo patterns, but I'm like, the that that idea that they're only tattoo patterns you know is what the anthropologists did because that's what they do to become experts in something right, it's right? About categorizing yeah things, categorizing right? things <laughs> and then we accept yeah. that those categories <laughs> are true mm. and that we have to stick within them mm. but the reality is is that it's a visual language that goes across all of our visual material culture and connects all of the kin that are sitting in museum collections so all of the kin that are you know in our homes you know mm -hmm. those are all our relatives that are there in those places and so i am i always tell people that you have to go visit mm -hmm. right you have to go visit those baskets those war clubs those things um because sometimes they haven't been visited in hundreds of years mm. by our people, mm. right? And so those are our kin that are there. So, you know, wherever you're from, whoever you're connected to, get to the museum and visit your kin. That's it. Um, and yeah, I wanted they're, they're to... Waiting, they're waiting oh, for us. Bro. <laughs> yeah, they're totally waiting. And it, I, I wanted to circle back again um, and thank you for giving me the replica of a tool mm. that you found. And yeah, I just man. wanted you give you an opportunity to talk about that experience of finding mm. a little gem that, you know, uh, even though people were familiar with it, uh, you know, people in your community probably weren't familiar with it. Not at all. Yeah. And so this is a powerful story for people to know that sometimes when you go to those museums, you're going to find things that your people have been looking for for a long time or didn't even know that they were missing. That's right? it. And so, yeah, just give yeah. you an opportunity to share, you know, what that experience was and, you know, where, where and how that all went down. Mm. So um, I think it was 20, uh, 2018, I think it was. Yeah, I got the opportunity to go to Switzerland and um, as part of a, a kind of arts conference. Um, and through that, I got to meet the curator of the um, – Museum of Cultures, mm. um, I think that's what it's called, Museum of Cultures in, in Basel, Basel, Switzerland. And, uh, you know, we, I, I'd arranged with her to um, visit the collection and visit the storeroom and, and um, you know, see if there were any kind of Tongan objects in there that might be of interest and, and, and other objects that may not yeah. be identified as Tongan, but I, mm. I might be able to identify as Tongan, yeah. you know. And uh, we went, so she was kind enough to uh, to take 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 me to the storeroom and uh, we went out the back and we were looking at kind of a, a, an area, a section that was kind of Western Polynesia, so it had some Fiji, yeah. Samoa, Tonga, those were probably the three main areas that it, it, um, it covered. And she pulled out this, uh, this like, probably like a shoebox size, um, archival box. And she said, Oh, there's, you know, there's probably, there's a few things here that might, in here that are, that are from this region. There might be something in there that's of interest to you. And yeah. it was, bro, it was literally like, you know, shoebox and just everything. Just chuck stuff in there. <laughs> like you know? the junk drawer. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It was that junk drawer, right? right? Yeah. yeah. Just the one just above the plastic bag drawer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so she opened up the box and we just you know started and pulling things out and looking and I recognised a couple of things like uh, there was a there was a feke lore like an octopus lore in there so I was like oh yeah that's cool and we got to this little almost cleared the box out and then I saw this kind of like uh, this little bone sort of object that was you know kind of yay big yeah and I was like whoa so I kind of picked it up and. So this, there was a little uh, tag kind of hanging off it, and it was, and it said it was a, a tattooing needle from Tonga. Oh. And I was just like, man, I was floored instantly because, you know, I'd been researching Tongan tattooing and and kind of mark making for some time at that point, 
and the reason I was there was to give a talk on tattooing yeah. and, and sort of share what I, I guess, my research to date. And, um, and there were descriptions of tattooing that, that you know, of, of dots and kind of small markings that to me, I don't know, just sounded like they would be made with some kind of hand poke tool, yeah. you know, because it's just kind of made. As a practitioner, you, you start to kind of yeah. understand, oh, well, that, that would work for this and yeah. well, that might not work for that. And uh, and I was just like, yeah, I was completely floored. And, you know, I'm holding this, this as a beautiful little object. Yeah. And on the end of it, um, the very tip was snapped off. Yeah. So it was it was potentially, you know, that much longer again and it was just all stained in black ink. Yeah. And uh, you know, it was a it was a discovery of a of a hand poke, a Tongan hand poke tattooing tool, which um, I I'm pretty sure had not been. I mean, it was in their collection, so it's been catalogued, but it's never been kind of focused in on or yeah. talked about or written about. Yeah. And I got to share some of um, about that particular tool through my master's um, yeah. thesis that I did. Yeah. It's just amazing for me to be able to. Um, one hold this object you yeah. know and and kind of that as, marked your ancestors that marked the ancestors man but and then also understand through holding it yeah. how this is a practical i could see how this would work yeah. you know it's a the scale of it the the way it sort of sits in your hand the kind of maneuverability of it you know yeah. it made total total sense as a, as a tattooing tool hand poke tool so yeah just uh it, it was it was a really profound moment, yeah. you know, to kind of be in the presence of this, of this tool, and to and to think about how many people it may have marked, and yeah. who it may have marked, and all the stories attached to this one little thing, you know. Yeah, because when you showed me the picture, like it looks like it was a pretty well used. Yeah, tool. man. Yeah, and the yeah. fact that it, the tip of it has been snapped off, you know, yeah. probably just yeah, yeah, it, it would have it would have done some work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to circle back and, you know, there'll probably be people like, oh, junk drawer. What, you know, junk <laughs> drawers are actually very important because they have all these things that you may need or you do need That's right. that uh, don't find another place to go. So That's junk right. drawers are important. So That's I wasn't right. saying that those objects were junk, just the reference of like a place where you catch all, you just put stuff that you don't have other categorical drawers for. That's it. Right? And stuff um, that's all just waiting to be used. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to make that clear. So, you know, those people out there who are like, hey, what about... <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, that's just such an exciting uh, discovery. Yeah. And I think the reality is, is that, uh, like you said uh, about Tongan tattooing, I would say... Um, all of our skin marking practices, you know, we are really just beginning to scratch the surface, mm. you know, and when I think about other communities, you know, uh, things to keep in mind when looking, you know, just tips, uh, you know, who were the early explorers that came there, so-called explorers, you know, uh, what nationality and what language mm -hmm. did they speak? Because a lot of times I'll be looking uh, say, for example, on the east coast of Canada, where I'm at in Mi'kma'ki, the Mi'kmaq territory, you know, the people that colonized there first were French. Hmm. So if you're a English speaking scholar, you're going to be missing a lot of that early scholarly, that early work that was written about it. That's right. So those are things just to keep in mind as people begin to do that research hmm. of finding out who were those first people that wrote and then what language. So that's like foundational, I would say, in terms of that archival research. Totally. And then the next thing is uh, the acquisition notes are also important, mm. right? And so you have those tools or those baskets or those whatever. Well, the person who collected them and sent them to the museum wrote notes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times those aren't looked at. Mm. So just encourage people to not only look at the object, but look at the notes. And I would say that I'm not really good at that even though i know that that's a good place to look you know a friend of mine went and looked for some rock art research and found drawings in the hand of the uh anthropologist of sketches of our tattoos our facial tattoos wow. in rock art research wow right and so there's like a lot of places to look that haven't been looked yet 
And so, yeah. And that kind of speaks to the interconnectedness of our practices, right? Yeah, big you know, time. Like you could look at rock art and discover yeah. the 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 uh, facial tattoos, right? So, yeah. so whatever story is contained in that rock art, for example, yeah. there may be an overlap into the yeah. into the uh, into the facial tattoos, you know. Yeah. That the person recording it at the time was kind of issued yeah. towards, right? Yeah, big time. You know, if you're going to capture this, also get yeah, that. Grab that too. Yeah. There's a really great example of that too. Um, one of the um, early drawings of uh, of a, a Tongan tattoo on a Vavau man mm. was captured, uh, was rendered by. Uh, one of the Spaniards who mm-hmm. they were the first people to really kind of like spend any serious time in Vivao. Yeah. And those records, after that expedition, the guy who led the expedition was chucked in jail and those records were locked away in the the, the Spanish uh, Maritime Museum. Yeah. And getting access to those is really, really difficult. But within that, they yeah. they captured a drawing. They started to to um to form a bit of a glossary of terms. Yeah. You know, they were they were talking with different people, um, capturing as much as they could of t- of that life of that time and and but like you say if you're not speaking Spanish that yeah. stuff's all unavailable to you. Yeah. Right? Big time. Initially unless you can find a a person to work with who's got the language and, and yeah. but the thing is around access, you know, getting yeah. into these spaces. Yeah, big time. I know the uh, the Vatican yeah. also has a huge. Um, I've heard apparently has a huge Tongan collection oh, right. that's kind of locked away, you know, because yeah. the, the Catholics came through Tonga and they had a stronghold in parts of Tonga yeah. in those early contact sort of days. Again, it's access, man. Yeah. You know, these people are really holding on to our things with with that kind of right of ownership. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, big time. That they kind of cast over all the things that they've collected. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. So, yeah. I, I mean, just, just supporting what you're saying, man. Like, be, be, cast the net wide. Yeah. And be kind of open to going down whatever the, road, comes. whatever road presents itself, yeah. you know. And sometimes finding a new, you're making a new road. <laughs> yeah. Big time. And I would say that sometimes you, uh, at the time of going down those little rabbit trails, you will, you have no idea what connections they may have back yeah. to the marks. Yeah, right? that's it. Uh, just because maybe it doesn't talk about tattooing, you know, maybe there's a story captured there, mm-hmm. you know, which later then you uh, realize, oh, that this marking is actually connected to that, mm-hmm. right? And so, yeah, just like you say, casting it wide, bringing as much back in that we mm. can um, is just so essential yeah. and to break free of those anthropological boxes. Yeah. You know, um, that's one of the things that I've come to realize as I've navigated academia, you know, uh, here and there is it's important for us to start writing and talking for ourselves. Yeah. Right. And to Critical, start asking man. new questions, Critical. right? Because, those papers, those books, those articles were written asking uh, colonial questions. Mm. It's time for us to look at them again and ask new questions, mm. you know, uh, start to think about those in a different way mm. so that when we come to a new conclusion, uh, it's from our own perspective, That's not it. from their perspective. That's it. Yeah. And I think to add to that too, like for us, uh, as practitioners, mm. that's a really valuable perspective to take yeah. in when when we're say looking for uh, material on tattooing, for example. Yeah. There's a practitioner's mind and eye that's going to yeah. see things, yeah, big time in a particular way, yeah, and, or understand things in a particular way, yeah, that relates back to the practice. Totally, yeah. and you know, <clears throat> even if the pattern isn't exactly the same, say from basketry mm. to uh, rock art to um, tattoo marks, skin marks, uh, by understanding this over here can help you to interpret something over here. Totally. Right. And so yeah. it's like beginning to learn that ancestral visual language. That's why I keep coming back to that. So you can start to begin to look at it through that visual language, which mm. was the first language that we had, mm. right? Even when we're coming out, you know, uh, and we're growing up, yes, we're hearing that. Uh, oral language but we don't understand it Mm. we're able to see all of the marks you know and that's why i think that's 
skin marking is so important is because we are repatriating those design symbols and motifs and they're walking around the world yeah right like yeah. in the past it would be on the waka it would be on the canoes it would be on the rocks it would be on the war clubs it would be everywhere that mm. visual language would be everywhere mm. but now the vast majority of it is in institutions that are gatekeeping them mm. in that very uh harmful gatekeeping way mm. of like possession mm. like this is what i possess mm -hmm. instead of i think sometimes uh gatekeeping isn't always explored in the right way sometimes mm. gatekeeping is like as a steward you know mm. i'm being a steward of this mm. right i'm caretaking for it as opposed to i possess it mm. but i think with those institutions they're possessing those yeah. things, right? Um, yeah, that's their kind of default position. Yeah, big time. Right? <laughs> like I own this stuff. This, this is, is ours. Mine. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, what is it? It's an asset of the institution, yeah, yeah, right? Big time. <laughs> you know, can you when you think about you know the conversation that we've been having and the things that we've been talking about? Is there anything that you feel like? you want to share you know because i always think for myself i've been through interviews and things and people I, when i afterwards i'm like oh i wish they would have asked me that question yeah, yeah, right yeah. you always have like an idea of maybe something that's lingering that needs to be said uh so just giving that opportunity as we round up yeah i think and we kind of touched on this earlier today like for me the work and uh, the carrying of the work and the whole process around the work is 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 a is a way of us remembering mm. who we are. Yeah. You know, remembering in a Tongan context, remembering our indigeneity, remembering that we this practice is part of of uh, of, of what defines us and has mm. defined us. Mm. You know, um, and can define us moving forward. Yeah, you know. Yeah. 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 No, I think that's a beautiful uh, kind of way to kind of tie up the conversation that we've just had, you know, because, you know, I love that the way that you use that word remember, because uh, in a lot of ways, you know, when you break it down, you know, uh, we are not only remembering who we are, but we we are remembering, so becoming members yeah, yeah. of our cultures again, nice. you know, of our communities, of uh, of our families sometimes, nice. because yeah. the colonial project was one that you know for us legislated us in and out of existence. You know, mm. the government decided who of us were Indian and who weren't. You know, and so that identified who could live in community and who it was illegal for you to live with your people. Um, so uh, it's an important thing for us to not only remember who we are, but to remember ourselves back to our communities mm. as members of those communities. So mm. I think it's a beautiful and a powerful place to end off. And I really thank you for taking the time to sit with me, uh, share the kava with me, and also, uh, you know, bring your client here to, you know, uh, do photographs for the Museum of Vancouver exhibition. And yeah, I just lift you up for all that you've done for the movement and that you're continuing to do for your people. Manuel, Peter, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just, yeah, um, respect to you for the work that you're doing, man. And this, this exhibition is is another huge um kind of moment in the in the in the momentum mm. around indigenous global indigenous tattooing man yeah. so yeah it's powerful work ah. so uh thank you yeah. yeah 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 i appreciate it um hey everyone thanks for stopping by and taking this journey with me uh through this episode i hope you enjoyed it i'll just ask that you would go and subscribe uh if you haven't already done so and if you have subscribed thank you very much i appreciate you uh following this journey i just want you to remember that uh no matter who you are where you're from, what you've done, or what you've been through, that uh, you are amazing, that you are loved, and that we need you here today and uh, going into the future so that we can transform this world for the better uh, through our collective thoughts, actions, feelings, and our compassion for each other as human beings. Head on over to next week's episode where I talk to Heather Kiskamon, a Cree artist based in Musquachis, Alberta. In this episode, we talk about the journey from uh, taking art school in Europe 
to being comfortable living back home on the reserve in Muskogee's. And the last thing that I will ask you is to do me a solid and share this episode with somebody that you think will enjoy it. Thanks a lot and see you next week.